I would certainly in, like to include CTE workforce development. I think that would be important if you know if we could come to that. But right now, again, like I said, we're still at the very beginning stages of, of doing things, and so I've been chatting with folks from other states, the chancellor's office in you know a variety of states, and people that were you know key stakeholders in, in creating their models, with the idea that maybe we can glean some important information from them and you know, learn from the mistakes that they made and then we can be maybe just that much farther ahead. So in, in terms of thinking about this model, we've, right now we've got a 12 month completion deadline. So the bill was enacted in uh, June, July of 2015 with on a two year funding cycle. So July 2015 to June 30th of 2017, which is when the bill sunsets. So at the end of that time, on June 30th, there of course will be a report that goes out to the legislator stating, you know, what's been our progress with OER, what have we done, what was the results of the grant, all of that sort of thing. And there's interest in sustaining this OER initiative over time, but it remains to be seen yet what's going to happen after June of 2017 when everything sunsets. So really right now I feel like I'm sort of on a fast-paced treadmill trying to make sure that I can, you know, reach a bunch of benchmarks. Um, make as many accomplishments as I can with OER and get this movement going and getting enough interest and support around it such that then we could continue work on beyond, 20, beyond June uh, 30th of 2017. And certainly just making a comment about that as well, um, from now until then there will be several um, full HEC commission meetings which are public hearing meetings. So any of you are welcome to attend, you can call in and listen to those meetings. You are also able to testify at those meetings if you feel like you have materials you want to present, you want to talk about OER, if, you, if there's something that import, of importance that you'd like to say to the commission, you know, either in support or against OER, what's working, what's not working, um, please contact me and I will, I will try to get you on the, on the session and make that happen. So, Teresa, after that June 7, uh, 2017 date, the bill is... So the bill, yeah, the bill, so portions of the bill go away. The grant, the grant essentially ends, my position ends. Okay. What doesn't end is the prominent designation. So mm -hmm. the prominent designation part continues on until such time as okay. the bill is rewritten or something else in the wording is changed. But the, the funding part goes away, my position goes away. Okay. So at that point, everything sort of stops. I think they take a look and see where, where have we been, what have we done, what, have, what progress have we made, and then where do we go from here. Yeah. So again, my email, teresa.wolf at state.org.us. Please email me if you have any questions, and I will, uh, after today, but I will take questions now. I have a quick question. Sure. You know, this idea has kind of been floating around about um, the word mandating, and so I'm just curious, because faculty are talking about this and saying, you know, will the state at some point mandate that a certain number of courses be OER, or is there any discussion of that? Or Not unless somebody a, creates a bill around that. Right, it's just a recommendation that we would really like this to happen. Yeah. Yeah. I, think, I think right now there's, there's a general, just nationwide, well there's a global movement if you look at the, at the OER, OER global map that I have posted up on the HEX website. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Amy may have it, you have it posted on? No, that's what's okay. Oregon. Um, that, so you go to the HEC website to find it. But there's certainly a concern about the cost of textbooks for students everywhere. Mm -hmm. What you know, going to going to college now is super expensive. The books have gotten increasingly expensive over time. And now there's a new way to be able to do this. And for me, as a former faculty member, I think it's it's sort of exciting because it's a way to be able to take material that's out there and create your own new material that then you can use with your students. So to me that feels like it's more of a better fit because you're not trying to take somebody else's work and then work it around, work curriculum in around how you teach. You can actually create materials based on your teaching pedagogy, based on your teaching philosophies, and really do students a better service. But no, I, 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 I doubt that, I mean, I can't say for sure because I can't predict the future, but I, sure. I can't even imagine. And I don't know of any other states off the top of my head that mandate the use of OER. And, and again, really, it is still all, all up to, I mean, the idea is that faculty still have a choice in what they, what and how they choose materials for their courses. So I can't see that anybody would ever be trying to say that you have to do that. I really love WISC Online. Um, I, love that one. Um, I know, 
CTD as oh, well. Awesome. I'm all about micrometers. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so having access, uh, I think I was talking um, when we had stepped into the room, um, about looking for that technical support for graphics. You know, I mean, we can all do death by PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. um, and, and of course, I'm really interested in interactivity, you know, as we begin to go to more online uh, sessions. However, I'm not the, um, I don't have the technical expertise to be able to make the materials what's in my mind's eye. And so I'm, I'm interested in, you know, what is the, the pathway to technical assistance um, for a graphic um, or whatever other needs I might be talking about that I'm not able to articulate right at the moment. Right. Um, but to make that, um, make those materials like a WISC online, you know, where they're available and static and stable. Yep. Um, for so I, I would say that, that technical assistance is probably going to have to come from within your institution first because everybody's using different learning management systems, everybody has different sort of platforms that they work on. So what may work for one may not necessarily work for another. So that would be the first place I would start. But then two, um, getting onto things like the Basecamp discussion board, Amy's uh, Google Groups, and having discussions with faculty across other institutions I think would be a really great idea of, you know, I have this idea, how do I make it happen? And, you know, and to me having the formulas collaborations and having those discussions about um, tech, certainly the technical aspects of it, because um, I've certainly struggled with putting up a web page before and having to sort of quick on the fly learn HTML programming, that you know, there are, you know, if there's an easier way to do it, um, and I have some ideas and I've been sort of chatting with Amy also about creating some webinars around things. So maybe that's something that we could think about doing is um, you know, creating you know, just some base webinars on you know, how, how, if you wanted to get a book printed, what would be the process you'd go through it? If you wanted to get materials up and use them, how, what? So in fact, I've even been using a tool recently called UCU that is um, really sort of, it's really interesting. Um, and it's sort of a video interactive platform that allows you, if you're teaching online, to be able to um, present a question and you can do it randomly to a student. So you assign students, you, know, might, you might record yourself doing five different questions and then when the student logs in, they're gonna randomly get assigned one of those questions. So it's almost like they're just being called on in the class and then they get recorded giving their answer and you can give them, you know, they have to do it in the first shot or they get two tries to do it or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I think things like that. Is UCU uh, letters or words? It's words. It's Y O U S E E and then the letter U at the very end. Okay. Yeah. Does, that, does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, it's a starting point. I mean, okay. it's a big. It's a and certainly big. email me if you have questions. And if, if I can't if I can't help you, I may know somebody that can and can try to point you in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Or I'll try to connect you with someone right. somewhere else that can do it. Another question. So as in, I, I like to call myself an OER ambassador. I'm, I'm cool with that. So uh, one of the things that I'm coming into conflict with, and I would love your opinion on this, are faculty that we are encouraging this, but they have very concerns. You, they have concerns, as you mentioned, they're very, the barrier of um, quality. Yes. So they're concerned about the quality, and they don't believe that the quality is good and what they can find out there, or it's too difficult to find. What do you recommend talking points perhaps to um, keep the conversation going with faculty. Certainly we're not forcing them, we're not mandating them, but we want to at least encourage, if you will. Yeah, so that actually is a really, really good question. Because um, like I said, I've, I've certainly used textbooks before that were really bad quality. I mean, that could be a, an, an easy starting point, I think, is to say that you know right. there are, are books out there that aren't of high quality and sometimes you're forced to use it because that's all there is. But the beauty of OER is that you can find maybe multiple sources and I think maybe sometimes this is where the disconnect comes in uh -huh. is faculty say that, oh, you know, I, I can't find anything that's high quality. It's like, okay, well tell me how many things you did find. Did you find 10, did you find five, did you find 20? And can you take bits and parts of those and put them together as a new OER for yourself that really does fit your curriculum? Because maybe something that they don't think it's high enough quality, maybe it has one little bit of pearl of information in there, one section that really seems relevant for their course or they really like, but then the rest of it's like, eh. And I certainly had textbooks like that where it's like, oh, there's one chapter that's great, the rest of it I didn't, and why do I want a student to spend $80 for 
a book and only use one chapter of it. Mm -hmm. So I think that might be might be talking points to, to start with. Two, really emphasizing the fact that um, you know the whole reason for doing this isn't to make faculty slave night and day and weekends and you know trying to create these things every time the sun comes up, but because we are trying to help students and really help reduce the financial burden on students for sure. attending college. So I, I would say those are some good talking points to yeah. start with, but if I come up with more, I'll send them to you. Yeah, yeah, that's great. <laughs> yeah. Also, as Teresa mentioned earlier, there are repositories that contain peer reviews. Right. Um, and so in addition to the points that you just made, you can also say, um, I'm not an expert in your field. I'm not a judge of quality. You really need to evaluate it for yourself. Check out the open textbook library. Check out the reviews from other faculty in the discipline. Um, peer review is how academics agree to determine quality. So that's really persuasive. Kind of that. Yep, and just and just like a journal article might be peer reviewed. The OER textbooks from you know quite a few of the repositories are peer reviewed, and you are all certainly welcome to review books on those or materials on those sites. You can sign up and they'll they'll like you know they'll go through go through a review process and you know give them your credentials and all that sort of thing. And so um, so I would highly encourage that because then that sort of gives you an idea of what's the peer review process going through. Um, great. We've also been kind of like talking around the edges of an issue which is Something that I've been thinking about, like when when you're teaching a course, like how much time out of all the time that it takes to develop and teach a course, how much time do you really want to spend on searching for the materials? Like under five percent, right? Like so, a lot of focus goes into that initial push to like find the right thing, but I just hate to see people fall down a rabbit hole of like, oh, I can't find stuff, or I feel like I'm not finding enough, or I'm not finding enough of, of high enough quality, and that's where librarians really come in. So asking a librarian or contacting Teresa or me. Um, you need buttons that say libraries are your best friend. Yeah, <laughs> seriously, because yeah. I mean, faculty time is really much more valuably spent on curriculum development, teaching, you know, making assessments that go with the new content. I mean, um, getting stuck on search is, it's such a shame when that happens. Because I know the standard reply will be, I don't have enough time. Mm -hmm. I can already hear it. Yep. I don't have enough time to do this and do it right. Sure. And do it well. I think that's probably a key piece right there. Oh, time is huge. And as, as we adopt a career technical, I mean, they're going to even say that more because sure. it's so much more difficult. I mean, if I'm looking at how to read a dial caliper, I mean, I've, I've been looking, you know, for months. Uh, yeah, for yeah. years. Yeah. You know, I go back and I read through, and it's like, okay, what's well, doing this? So then I have to create it myself, and then I don't have the technical expertise to create the materials myself. Um, and so I hope this broadens the CTE because within the domain of community colleges, I mean, we're charged with, with workforce development, you know, and right. so I, I right. understand that the push is going to be for higher education initially, but I would really love to see the bill extended, and, you know, and specifically call out um, those STEM or CTE areas because we have very expensive textbooks yes. that could use a lot of initiative and a lot of support. I taught previously in lab medicine, so I know about the expensive textbook. But actually, your comment just sort of brings me back to the question that you had, and then something I had had a conversation with about with someone the other day, is um, you having a question about how do I technically, how do I do this technically? This is a great way to bring your students in. So if you've got students that have technical knowledge and you've got them in a class already and they're using calipers or micrometers or you know any other kind of you know instrumentation, spectrophotometers. I've had, and I certainly know that I have had students in my classes that were amazing illustrators and you know doing all kinds of other things, and they you know they'd show me the stuff that they did. This would be a great way, and especially for faculty that say I don't have enough time, assign them, and make it make it an assignment, put it put it as part of your curriculum, and say, oh you know I we need to find a good resource for this. So and it, one of the examples I had was um, um, a course that I was teaching previously. And, and realized this is medicine, so I was teaching your analysis. <laughs> um, and students needed to learn several different disease processes that um, were based, that you know, diagnosis was based on, on urine findings. So what I did was I needed a series of case studies, and I could not find a book with a significant number of case studies that was kind of scattered all over. 
So what I, what I did for the, with them, with this entire group, and of course I had 50 students, was I assigned them in pairs or in groups of three, and I said, okay, you've now got this disease process, write me a case study for this. And I want you to present it to the rest of the class, just like you're doing, just like you'd be doing at Grand Rounds if you were at the hospital and you were presenting to other physicians. Let, let me see you do that. And so that was the way that I then ended up with an entire group of case studies that were actually really well done and that you know I could use for the next couple of years and have students then do that. And so and in the process, students were both learning about the process, they were learning presentation skills, and there was a whole host yeah. of other things. So you can get them to create a Creative Commons license on and, work, and then you permission. Right, yep, right. and yeah. you know, they could get their name on it, so they could say, hey, look, I've created this, so that's something that they could even put on their CD. That totally leads to my question, because I'm, I'm really interested in that kind of next step of like the OER pedagogy piece, and so does the bill have any of support around that, or are people interested in that, or I mean, because we're talking about sort of repositories for textbooks and things like that, and I'm more interested in not necessarily adopting textbooks, but helping instructors see how students can create their own problem solve together. Right. Yeah. 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 And exactly. then all these problems we're talking Flipping about. The paradigm. Yeah. Right. You know, yes. around well, I don't have time to find it, or you know, is it good quality? All of that gets put into the classroom yeah. process, you yeah, know? Absolutely, yeah, so. no, the bill doesn't have any, any provisions for that, and certainly would never mandate anything like that, but those yeah. are actually great questions to have, and to be able to network with others, so on Amy's group, yeah. on the group that I've got, the discussion, I would certainly open those discussions up, because I haven't seen anyone having those kinds of discussions yet, but I've certainly individually had conversations like that with people. Well, and I've been putting feelers out, so I, you know, I've sent out a couple calls on the Open Oregon Listserv, which you can sign up on the contact page, um, and to say, you know, hey, we're collecting resources that have been adopted. Let's collect practices that have been adopted. Yeah. Um, and so I've got a survey out that I'm trying to, I, I give a few examples of open educational practices, like the ones that we've been talking about, and I say, does this sound like your course? If so, please fill out this short survey. Um, I don't want to make a page on the website until I've got a good handful of examples. So I've got one. Oh, no, am I really but still the only one? So far you're the only one, <laughs> so but I'll send another reminder. Um, I just think there's something, um, well, of course it's easier to be like, yeah, here's a link to the OpenStax book. Like, there's right. something easier about yeah. sharing the materials than it's sharing kind of the teaching I strategies. No. It is. Yeah. And people often feel like, oh, wait, it's not perfect, or I'm going to redo it next right. time anyway, or, you know. But just to, to start um, being able to share, like, okay, here's some strategies from the simple to the complex, sometimes you hear about them and you're like, that would work really well with graduate students, yeah. right? Like some, right. David Wiley's textbook that his students yeah. mm -hmm. contribute to every semester. It's like, yeah, that's a master's level class and they can write their own book. And, and his totally is, but I have to say, there is an assumption, and I've heard it at a couple of the OER events that I've been to, that certain levels of students can't handle certain types of uh, <laughs> whatever. Mm -hmm. and. Um, and I just, in my experience, I disagree. You know, I've, I've taught developmental students for years, and they will step up to the plate, and they will find really interesting and they resources. They will come up with some really pragmatic problems to solve. They you know? sure will. Yeah, and that, you know, that the other students wouldn't even consider. Yeah, and information literacy is like one of the most important skills we teach in higher ed, <laughs> and I just think that, you know, Absolutely. why not incorporate that into everything? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So having them demonstrate that they've mastered those learning objectives in a way that contributes back to the course or contributes you know, in some way beyond what David Wiley calls the disposable assignment. Mm -hmm. And I think that also gives them a sense of ownership too. Yeah, absolutely. I know students were really excited when I had talked about trying to do a OER book, for, especially for that your analysis class, and I was gonna have them look at, try and find specific elements under the microscope, and then we were gonna compile together a book of photomicrographs because the one book that was really good to use is out of print, and if you can find a used copy, it's like two hundred dollars, and it's only you know it's only about this big, but it's super handy because it's nothing but photos. That's yeah. all it really is for identification for identification purposes, purposes. Right. exactly. Right. And so it really needs an update. And I thought, wow, this would be a really great way to get yeah. students updates. Uh, Cora Watts talks about um, making an open nutrition textbook with a team at Pierce College, and she said that they got to the chapter on vitamins and. They just couldn't stand the idea of making the chart with the vitamins and their properties. 
And finally, they were like, oh, we'll just assign it to the students. We'll make them do it. <laughs> so, yeah, okay, take a vitamin. Tell me what it does. Where do you find out what does it do for your body? Um, it's cross-sourcing so. information. Yeah. <laughs> I'm probably exaggerating, I probably like that in that room, but. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any other questions? Or did we talk over? Teresa, that was yeah, really fantastic. Oh, thank that you. was a fantastic. Very 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 oh, thank you. Yes. 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 Yes.